Um, and what I want to do with this talk is to tell you a little bit about my most recent research on news consumption. There's not going to be a lot of visual content, unfortunately, but hopefully some of you have some brilliant idea. And so this could be pan out to include also images. Um, but partly inspired by the talks that I saw yesterday, I also want to give you the bigger picture of how I think about sociological research in this digital age. And I also want to distinguish um, the shiny and the messy parts of research, to paraphrase Luca. Uh, so the research that we sell baked and glazed, and uh, the research that messes up with us because we still don't fully understand uh, the findings that we are producing. And so that will be something that will occupy the last part of my talk, and so I'm going to start with the shiny part. This is the plan for the talk. I'm going to start, as I said, with a bigger picture and with a brief discussion of how digital traces allow us to unpack the mechanisms that drive social dynamics uh, through the lens of how, you know, this is a discussion that, that's affected by my own background as a sociologist, but I'm not a mainstream sociologist, so I think hopefully that will also be reflected in this bigger picture. Then I'm going to zoom into a project that is still ongoing, uh, in which me and my collaborators, we analyze patterns of news consumption, and I will use this project to highlight three research problems that I think a lot of us uh, confront. One has to do with measurement, uh, or rather with how we have been measuring things in the past and the limitations of those measurements. Another has to do with how we theorize about uh, things that we couldn't observe before, but that we can observe now. And there's not a lot of theory about those things because we didn't have any measurements. And then uh, another uh, has to do with how to best characterize, this is more specific to this particular project, how to best characterize the media landscape in a way that can be compared across countries and across media channels. Because the truth of the matter is that a lot of the scholarship in this particular domain is still dominated by US politics, which is great, it's super interesting, but it kind of limits the, generali the ability to generalize our theories uh, to encompass other political contexts and other cases. Then I'm going to move on to the third part of the talk, and this is where I'm going to discuss the messiest <laughs> part of my current research, because this is uh, where I'm going to discuss a project uh, that is still very embryonic, um, and uh, hopefully you'll get a sense of how even allegedly consolidated researchers still struggle to make sense <laughs> of, uh, of their work. And then I will close the circle and we'll go back to the beginning and to the bigger picture. And I'm super used to being interrupted all the time by my students, and so please, this is stuff that I'm so used to talking about that I might take a lot of things for granted. Don't hesitate to raise your hand and stop me. I would actually kind of welcome some back and forth. Otherwise, I'll keep on talking, but so do interrupt me if there's something that needs clarification or something that, you don't, uh, that I'm not explaining uh, well enough. Okay, so let's start with the big picture and with the book. <laughs> And the reason, you know, the, 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 the big picture is something that I considered in this book, and that's why I'm starting here. I want to start with this book because it is the one place where I extensively consider the question of why and how digital, change, uh, digital data changes the way in which we think about society and collective behavior. It doesn't necessarily change the main questions, the driving questions, but it is changing the way in which we are attacking those questions. And in particular, in this book, I pay special attention to one aspect of social life that I always found intriguing. It's a little bit abstract, but it's something that I was always interested in, and that is the paradox of unintended effects. And this is a paradox because it essentially tells us that intentional actions at the individual level often trigger unintended consequences on the collective level. And perhaps this is the biggest difference between sociologists and psychologists, that uh, we are interested in individual actions only as a way of explaining collective outcomes. And it turns out that some, often those collective outcomes, those social dynamics, were not intended by any of the individuals involved, but they are brought about by their actions. And um, so the question that motivated me to write this book is why does this happen and how can we regulate those unintended effects, especially when they are negative, when they are perverse. And so the core argument that I defend in this book is that the reason why digital technologies allow us to solve the puzzle of unintended consequences, and by extension, many of the questions that we have about social life is because they make networks more salient, networks interdependent, social influence, they make those things more salient and easier to analyze. Now, Jacqueline gave a great overview yesterday of how urban sociologists um, have thought about their object of study for decades. 
and how they can now revisit many of the old methods with the help of digital tools. And so this is my take on how sociologists have thought about collective behavior since the very early days of the discipline. This is a very brief timeline of what is a very rich uh, stream of research, uh, which for decades try to make sense of dynamics that cannot be reduced to social structures. And this is another way in which sociologists usually think about the social world in terms of social structures. And so you as an individual, given your demographic attributes, fit in one, pi in one pigeonhole or another, right? Uh, this is an alternative to that way of attacking the social world. Um, and so this stream of work is interested in dynamics that include the analysis of crowds, fads, fashion, rumors, the emergence of norms, opinion formation, social unrest, and social movements. And so if you read this work, uh, over and over the authors complain about the empirical limitations that they faced when doing their job. So for instance, in the 1950s, some sociologists wrote, Collective behavior is not yet an area in which generalizations can be presented in precise form and with the backing of experimental or quantitative evidence. Then in the 60s, some other sociologists wrote, because of their magnitude and complexity, collective phenomena are not directly amenable to observation under the kind of rigorously controlled conditions most sociologists would choose. And no wonder, right? Collective behavior is by definition spontaneous and unpredictable. And this makes it very difficult to analyze. And then in the 70s, things uh, started uh, changing a little bit with the first mathematical models that offered the possibility of conducting more sophisticated thought experiments. But again, these developments were limited by the fact that they could not be validated with empirical data. And this is what digital technologies, trace data, and computational methods changed. Right? They have made available the data resources, but also the techniques to test what are essentially very old theoretical intuitions. Uh, and so, as I argue in the book, there are specifically three areas of inquiry that have benefited greatly uh, from the analysis of digital traces and the sort of bottom-up dynamics that we generate while using online technologies. The first uh, is the study of aggregated patterns of collective attention, and here the focus lies on temporal dynamics and what makes groups of people suddenly pay attention to the same news or talk about the same issue. Then we have a second area of research which refers to the analysis of networks and information flow. And here the focus lies uh, on the structural properties of those networks, on how those structures change over time, and how they shape dynamics of information diffusion. And then we have a third level of analysis that zooms into individuals. <laughs> it refers to the individual level mechanisms that allow those um, uh, other higher level dynamics to emerge. And so it is by putting these three levels of analysis together that we can start unpacking, or so I argue in the book, the question of why individual actions often result in unintended consequences on the collective level. And so just to give you some examples of the type of research that is possible on each level of analysis, I'm going to use the work of my colleagues and fellow speakers, so you can then hopefully talk with them about their work. So for example, in this paper that was very recently published, Andreu Casas and co-authors, um, use social media to determine if legislators are responsive to the public when choosing which policy priorities they discuss. And so the focus here is on the temporal dynamics uh, of online political talk and who's leading and who's following in those conversations. I really encourage you to read this paper. Then on this mesoscale level of networks of information diffusion, we have work like this one that Nicola and co-authors published uh, in which they look at how Network structure not only shapes information diffusion, but also responds to those communication patterns. So both structures co-evolve over time. And I cannot emphasize enough how difficult it was to analyze these dynamics empirically before. It was hard enough to collect network data uh, for groups larger than 50 people. And, um, and so you know, this really revolutionized how we think work like this, how we think about the you know, co-evolving dynamics of communication and social networks and the constant feedback loops that happen. And so you know, we can now unpack the complexity of the process and kind of attack it empirically. And then on the level of individual exposure, we have research like this, in which Yelena and co-authors uh, explore, mechani co explore mechanisms of emotional contagion in the context of health behavior. And again, like, so here, the idea is that if you see your friends exercise and that makes you happy or it makes you sad and depressed because you're not exercising, the question is, are you more or less likely to exercise yourself? 
And again, this was kind of these mechanisms of social influence were very difficult to pin down empirically before, even more to control for all the other confounding factors. And so this is the kind of work that we can do now. And of course, this is helping us develop our theoretical understanding of these key mechanisms that uh, um, regulate uh, social life. And so this is my big picture, preamble. Any questions so far? All right. So let's start um, zooming into a specific project. I'm going to step away from the big picture now and start narrowing down on this project that is still ongoing. This project is a collaboration with colleagues from the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford, in particular Rasmus Nielsen and Sylvia Majot. And so in line, of the, uh, in line with the argument of the book, one of the things that we are trying to demonstrate with this project is that when we pay attention to what people do as opposed to what they say uh, that they do, we can gain some insights that we couldn't gain before. And this is particularly important in the analysis of news consumption because most prior research use self-reported data. So essentially, you ask people, so how often do you consume news? And then people would tell you daily or weekly or once a month. And then you might even ask them, so which news sources do you actually consume? And then they would tell you, was the New Yorker or the New York Times, whatever. And um, we've known for some years now that this way of eliciting news exposure, information about news exposure, has very, um, a lot of limitations. Uh, so so it, we, we can't really get at the actual exposure that individuals get. And um, somehow we have still kept on using those survey measures, right? Just to contextualize uh, this, uh, this project, the work that I'm going to discuss now operates at the level of aggregated patterns of collective attention. We are not analyzing a lot of individual level data. And in the context of this particular research, we analyze uh, the data in the form of networks of co-exposure to news or networks of audience overlap, um, which are very similar to uh, the sort of networks that we've seen already in some of the talks about hashtags being co-used uh, or like two news sources citing, talking about the same event. Um, most of the data that we're analyzing here comes in the form of web browsing behavior. So this is observational data uh, that tracks what people do when they go online. And it's proprietary data. We had to buy it <laughs> from an online measurement company. The advantage of uh, this data is that this company has panels that are representative of the online population in a bunch of countries. And we got data for 24 of those. And so our goal is to build these networks and then compare the patterns of news consumption across all these different countries. And there are really not that many data sources that allow us to do that. All right, so as usual, the motivation of this project is a list of shortcomings that we think limit the empirical scope of prior work. One of those limitations is that there is not enough comparative evidence assessing how digital technologies have changed the consumption of news across media environments, how fast that change is happening, um, and uh, which demographic groups are more responsive to it. And there is also a scarcity of research determining how access to news differs across channels or platforms. And we don't have a lot to say about that yet, but we are trying. <laughs> and so this is what I will discuss at the end of this talk. A second limitation refers to the flaws that we know, uh, as I already mentioned, affect self-reported measures of news consumption, which again are prevalent in this type of research, especially in the social sciences. And the problem with these measurements is not only imperfect recall of the media consumed, which is not very good at, uh, at, at recalling what news you accessed during the past week or let, let alone the past month, the other limitation is that survey instruments impose a limit on the number of media outlets that can be analyzed. And so this effectively cuts out the long tail of media options that is so characteristic of digital environments. And there's only so many news sources you can ask people about before they die of boredom. And so this is one big limitation, especially because one of the big transformations that happen in this digital age is that now we have all these media options, all these sources available online. Um, so it's much more fragmented, uh, the media environment is much more fragmented, fragmented in that sense. And then a third limitation refers to the conventional way in which the literature in political communication differentiates uh, media environments, which essentially boils down to the poor choice, high choice uh, dichotomy. And this is a binary classification that sums up the transition from mass media to network forms of uh, communication, but that hides nonetheless the diversity that high choice media environments still contain. And so we think that this limits our ability to understand 
uh, news consumption in the, in the digital domain. And so with this project, we aim to solve some of those limitations by making three contributions. The first is a methodology to measure patterns of news consumption using observational data. The second is to come up with new metrics that allow us to compare those patterns over time and across countries in a standardized way. And the third goal is to use those metrics to explain trends and differences in news consumption as they relate to the media and regulatory context in which they take place. And so sometimes when we analyze what happens online, we forget that those dynamics don't happen in a void, that actually the way the, 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 the technologies are regulated affect those dynamics. I don't know how many of you know that Google News doesn't operate in Spain because the government decided to come up with a new tax that so if you, you know, created a link to content that you didn't uh, produce, and that was Google News, uh, publishing links to news sources and snippets of the news sources. According to this new regulation, they had to pay whoever the newspaper, whichever newspaper had created that content. Of course, Google News said, yeah, we, we, we can't pay that. And so they shut down, right? And so regulation matters. And we don't fully understand how regulation shapes these dynamics. And so that's ultimately uh, also one of our goals with this project. And so we happen to believe that if we do these things, we will improve our theories of news consumption while still building on past and uh, recent work. All right, so the data that we're analyzing in its raw format looks something like this. We have information on which news outlets individual consumers access. And with that information, we can build a network where the nodes are the news outlets and the ties give us the strength of the overlap in the audiences that consume those outlets. So this is essentially, as I said, a co-exposure network where edges indicate uh, where people are exposed to content to any pair uh, of news sites. Uh, as I already mentioned, the data that we use in this project is collected by an online measurement company that operates in dozens of countries in which they maintain panels that are representative of the online population and they track web browsing behavior. In some of these countries, they also track multi-platform, uh, like multi-device uh, behavior. So it's not only that they're tracking what happens on the web, but also on mobile devices. And this is essentially our um, main source of data. But yes? So uh, right, not now. You have to pay a lot of money to get it, <laughs> which means you have to get a grant. Yes, yes, no. We, was that? <laughs> it's Probably not. We are trying to make the, so one of the things we promised the NSF when we got this grant is we would make not the original data files, it's a lot of processing, but we will make those available. Um, uh, there's another company, there's two companies that compete with each other. <laughs> there's another company that also has similar data and uh, potentially there's a third party that is trying to arrange access to that data uh, through a data license agreement but for free. So I'm happy to talk with you more about it. Um, but yeah, this is what it is. <laughs> and you know, you have to sign a contract when you buy this data and so it's not that you can share it, right? Um, but I, I, one of the things that we are also happy about, or at least that we're trying to do, is that the methodology is not only useful to analyze this data, right? Like you could also obtain data from Twitter and then see how people engage with news from different sources and build a similar type of data structure. And that's the idea, because ultimately what we want to do is be able to build these networks of audience overlap across media channels. So it's not only the web, but also <coughs> like social media, or if we get access to TV news consumption, which is still the main source of political information for people, we can also do the same thing, right? Um, now, one of the statistics that we pay attention to is uh, this measure of audience overlap. And so this statistic gives us, as I said, the number of visitors to a given news site that access another news site. So say people who go to the New York Times that also access the Washington Post. And so this is what allows us to build a media level projection um, where, again, nodes are news outlets and the edges measure the number of unique visitors that are co-exposed. One of the reasons why we analyze these networks is because they allow us to measure things like fragmentation in news consumption in a very precise way, right? So for instance, in this schematic representation, the media network has two separate components that are formed by outlets that share no audience. And so in this hypothetical scenario, fragmentation results from the decision of individual users uh, to select into uh, specific outlets. Now, of course, whether such patterns of fragmentation emerge from empirical data, uh, or whether these patterns differ across national context is, uh, th these are all empirical questions that require measurement and analysis, and so that's why we're doing this project. All right, so that was the high-level description of what the raw data uh, looks like. 
Once we process that data, we can build co-exposure networks as they change over time and across political context. And so if we think of these networks as maps of media landscapes drawn by individual users when deciding which news sources to consume, then what we have here are sort of movies of how those landscapes change over time and how they differ across countries, but also across platforms. Um, so as I said, we have data for 24 different countries uh, spanning a period of five years, and uh, we have monthly aggregates um, of web browsing behavior since October of 2014 until December of 2018. And so in total, we are analyzing more than 1,200 networks. And again, like our goal is to come up with measures because these networks vary a lot in terms of density, weight distribution, size, and we're trying to come up with ways that allow us to compare those networks in a standardized uh, way. So far, we have processed data for five of these countries. The rest is still work in progress. And so most of the stuff that I will tell you will relate to these countries. Now, there are three things that we want to do with this data, really. One is to reassess the problem of measurement. And as I said before, most of the research in this area still relies on self-reported data. And we know that this is a very unreliable source to measure exposure to news. We've known this um, since at least 2009, when this article by Marcus Pryor was published, uh, in which he sort of measured how inflated self-reported news exposure is. So this article was very persuasive. Uh, uh, but somehow it didn't really have an impact. People still use survey data, I guess, because that's the best thing people can access. Uh, but it focused on television viewing in the year of 2000 uh, for the US. And so in a way, what we wanted to do was to follow up um, the spirit of this article, but also assess how uh, self-reported news consumption compares to actual exposure now that we have essentially a screen with us all the time. So these refer to TV news consumption, and now we have all these other sources of information, and so we wanted to follow up and see if we find uh, similar um, uh, inflated measures when we compare survey uh, data with observational data tracking online activity. And so, um, again, remember that we have data for 24 different countries, and we wanted to have a source of self-reported news consumption that existed for all those countries. And so one such source is the digital news report that the Reuters Institute publishes yearly. And one of the questions that this survey asks is about the brands that people consume when consuming news. Uh, so what you have on the screen is an example of how uh, that data is reported. So for example, in 2018, 18% of internet users uh, reported going to the Huffington Post, 17% reported going to the New York Times, and so on. Um, and so of course you can only get this sort of information for the top brands. Um, and so by comparing this ranking with the ranking derived from the web browsing behavior data, then we can start assessing how much difference there is between self-reporting of self-behavior, but only for the outliers, only for those brands that are visible enough for, you, for, for people to remember them when you ask them in the context of a survey. But we did that, right? And this is what this uh, scatterplot tries to summarize. It summarizes the comparison. On the vertical axis, we have the rank position of these new sources according to the survey. On the horizontal axis, we have the rank position according to the web data. And so if there were a full agreement, then all these dots would fall in the diagonal. But as you can see, they don't, right? And so there's very different, um, the prevalence or sort of the visibility of these new sources is very different depending on whether you ask people or you actually observe what they do. More specifically, if we look at the percentage reach of these sites, we can see more clearly the differences between self-reported and observ observational data. So here we have four new sites. For the web data, we have monthly aggregates. Uh, the surveys only give us yearly estimates, and so that's why uh, we have segments. Um, and as you can see, in most instances, the survey actually underestimates the percentage of people that gets exposed to these sources. Uh, and it's also not very good either at tracking trends. So, uh, for example, less and less people have been consuming the Huffington Post, and more people have been consuming the online versions of CNN, Fox, and the New York Times. And these trends are very difficult to identify with the survey estimates. Interestingly enough, this is also the opposite of what Marcus Pryor found in the 2009 paper, where he said that self-reported data inflates exposure to TV news, but in this case, we find the opposite. Um, and we find very similar dynamics in other countries. So for example, this scatterplot corresponds to Germany. And again, the new sites are far from aligning in the diagonal. And if we look at the actual percentage reach, the survey also underestimates actual exposure for most 
sources except for the Spiegel, which people claim to consume more than they actually do. Um, and so it's probably one of my German, one of my colleagues at the Weizenbaum Institute actually said, this is probably the, the, because of the desirability effect, right? It looks good to consume the Spiegel, looks better than to consume the tabloid uh, built. Um, and so this pattern comes up over and over in all the countries that we're analyzing, right? So bottom line, I don't trust survey data anymore. <laughs> or at least I'm, I, I'm aware of the, of the kind of bias that in the estimation. Now, the second thing that we want to do with this data is look at the full range of news sources, right? And not just at the top percent that is visible enough for people to remember naming them when you ask them in a survey. And the thing is, the vast majority of news sources online have very small reach. They would never appear in survey data, right? So here we have the reach distribution for the news sources that are part of the web tracking data for the US. There's about 400 domains that come up. Uh, the, the web domains that are classified as news, political information. On the vertical axis, we have the percentage reach, so that's the percentage of the online population that access those websites on a monthly basis. And so surveys only give us data for some of the outliers, right? The most prominent sources that people remember when you ask about them. But the thing is that the vast majority of news sources online have very small reach. They would never appear in survey data, and still on the aggregate, they do attract the attention of a significant number of people. And so we want to be able to analyze the outliers, but also uh, uh, the non-outliers. And so this brings me to the third question. The, the third thing we want to do with this project is characterize the media landscape that all those news sources, outliers and non-outliers, create. And for that, we use the measure of audience overlap that I mentioned before. And so again, um, this measure of audience overlap allow us to build networks of co-exposure where the nodes are new sources and the weighted ties tell us how many people consume a given pair of sources. And the way we think about these co-exposure networks is as instances in a continuum that goes from extreme fragmentation to absence of fragmentation, right? So depending on how people consume news, uh, these networks of audience overlap can look very different. On the one uh, hand, you know, on the one extreme, that would be network number one, we have a scenario where there is no overlap, um, and so the nodes, the news sites, share no audience, and consequently are disconnected. And so, of course, this would be a case of extreme fragmentation and audience self-selection. On the other extreme, that would be network number five, we have a scenario of complete overlap, and so here all sites share audience uh, with all the other sites in the network, and as you can probably, you're probably thinking, yeah, but like most likely most empirical networks don't fall in any of these two extremes, right? And that's right. So we know that most empirical networks will never be either, will never resemble networks number one or number five. They are likely to fall somewhere in between. And the question is where? Uh, and so this figure gives three other schematic examples of intermediate cases. We have one in which the network is highly centralized around a hub. That's network number three. We have a more decentralized version where audience overlap is more evenly distributed, that's network number four. And then we have a case where, again, there are two clusters of sites that share no audience among them, but, um, uh, sorry, two clusters that share audience within, but they're disconnected from each other. And so that would be network number two. And what we're trying to do in this project is differentiate these possibilities and determine if news consumption in specific media environments with their specific regulatory frameworks can be better defined by structures two, three, or four. Now, I mean, there's only so much I can fit into a talk. Uh, we introduced this methodology in a paper that came out a few months ago. So if you're interested in going through all the details, you can find the details here. Uh, but essentially what we did in this paper is introduce the methodology um, by paying attention to three countries that represent very different uh, uh, media environments, right? We have the UK which has a long history of public service media that is widely used and well-funded. We have the US media market, which is dominated by private organizations and characterized by an automized uh, supply. And we have the Spanish case, which is also characterized by government intervention in the media market, but this intervention is much weaker than in the UK. And additionally, in recent years, we have seen a fast proliferation of digital-born outlets. So these are news outlets that didn't exist before the internet. Um, and some of them founded by journalists and editors with established careers in legacy media organizations. So if you compare the ratio of legacy media brands and digital born outlets in Spain, they are roughly 50-50, which is something that we don't see in other countries. Legacy media uh, organizations still prevail, right? 
Um, and so prior research doesn't really, so we know that these um, media landscapes are different qualitatively, but prior research doesn't really offer much guidance as to how to capture these differences with metrics that can be compared in a standardized fashion. And so again, we're hoping to provide those uh, and in the process uh, promote comparative research. And I know that you are representing a lot of countries here, so you know, I think we, ha we need more comparative research. So hopefully you can contribute to that yourselves. Um, this is a summary of our data collection strategy and observation windows. It's just a schematic representation of the data. There's no empirical data here yet. Uh, for the UK and the Spanish cases, we analyze audience duplication data for the months of May, June, and July. So that's a month um, before, during, and after the Brexit referendum and the Spanish 2016 general elections. For the US case, we analyze audience data for the months of October, November, and December. So that's the period surrounding the 2016 presidential elections. And since audience overlap statistics fluctuate, we use the three month averages to build the networks that we then analyze. And again, in these networks, nodes are new sites that map um, and the ties map the strength of the overlap between those sites. The stronger a tie is, the more people access a given pair of new sources. Um, and so we then, just to illustrate how this approach can also help us understand differences across demographic, uh, uh, along demographic lines, uh, and potentially you know, across uh, media channels, we then slice the networks by age groups, which is a segmentation that we use just to illustrate how this method can be used uh, to compare audience behavior within countries uh, as well as across countries. Um, um, and also to test the hypothesis that uh, you know, younger people use digital technologies differently. Uh, spoiler, they don't seem to use it that much differently. Um, all right, so as I already mentioned, our goal is to be able to compare these networks uh, and determine where they fall in that continuum of fragmentation to no fragmentation. Uh, I'm gonna get a bit technical now. A step prior to the analysis of these networks uh, involves filtering them so that we only retain, that's a hand, yeah. Um, I have a question before you go. Yes. Uh, we wanted to focus on news consumption during salient political events because that's when people are more proactive in kind of getting information of what's going on. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is compare if these salient political events make a difference for how people consume news. Mm -hmm. And uh, the preliminary findings we have on longitudinal dynamics are not, um, the connectivity of the network doesn't change too much. What changes is the, the weights and you know, the, the overall reach of these sites. Right? So there's some fluctuation, like when this stuff that is politically important happening, people consume news, okay, people, web users <laughs> go to the domains of these news sources in higher numbers. But the actual overlap, like the, the structure of the network doesn't seem to change much. Mm -hmm. But we anticipated reviewers asking, you know, like if you just choose a random period of time, <laughs> they would ask why this period, and at least here we had a reason, you know, these are, you know, during the electoral cycle, these are the moments where, peop where inf information matters most. That's why. A good question. <laughs> um, all right, so, so a step prior to analyzing these networks uh, involves filtering the network so that we only retain the overlap that is statistically significant because the truth of the matter is that some of these overlap might result from just random browsing behavior. And so the filtering technique that we propose in this paper is known as backbone extraction. Luca mentioned it in his talk briefly. And so essentially what this technique does is eliminate ties that do not depart significantly from what would be expected under a null hypothesis of random weight distribution. And this is one possible null model, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but that's the one we choose. So for illustration, if you look at panel B, here we show a simulated network before, so this is not empirical data yet, the empirical data is very much like a, like a hairball, right? So <laughs> there's no way you can see a lot of, uh, on that, but so if you look at panel B here, we show a simulated network before and after the backbone has been extracted. The thickness of the lines is proportional to tie weight, which again, in our case, measures the strength of the audience overlap. The color of nodes in this visualization indicates clustering. So these are sites that are better connected internally than to other sites in the network. And as you can see, the backbone network is sparser because we have eliminated many of the weakest ties. Now, of course, what counts as a strong 
or a weak tie depends on many things, depends on the node adjacent mostly to, to that tie. New sites that have a large audience, think BBC, will have stronger connections to other sites than smaller outlets that have less audience, right? And so we wanted to make sure that the filtering mechanism that we apply to just retain the most significant overlap uh, would respect that uneven distribution in total reach of the sites. And that's what the backbone extraction does. It takes into account the fact that the significance of tie strength is relative to the node that is being considered. So if you look at panel C now, here we summarize the null model that allows a technique to take into account disparity in the distribution of weights and determine statistical significance. And so the first thing we do is normalize the weights of all ties surrounding um, a given node that they fall in the interval zero to one. Uh, and then those weights are distributed uniformly so that each tie has the same strength. And then essentially these randomized weights express the null model, right? So this is the benchmark that we use to then determine how much we depart from that um, random um, scenario. We compare these uniformly distributed weights with the observed weights and only in cases where the difference is larger than a critical value, and think of this as a p-value that we use in statistical research, then the ties are retained as statistically significant. And of course, there's two choices here. Null model is one and the other one is what's the right p-value to choose. Yes. Um, so what about in the case, uh, so I guess uh, when you say you're normalizing the uh, weights, um, so there's two weights interacting within a tie, so like, wouldn't one expect the, the weight of the stronger, uh, the, or the node with the stronger sum of weights to be more radiated at this point? Um, I mean, even if the proportion is greater than that of the, uh, is, is equivalent to that of the So the approach, the approach only retains the ties that are statistically significant for both nodes that are connected by the tie. Right? <laughs> so it has to be significant for both, si for the both ends of that edge. Is that what you're asking? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just seeing that it's only taking into account it's like one tie between two different nodes, but these two different nodes may have different gravity properties. Uh, let's talk about that later. Um, so, I mean, essentially, the, the, so, when we were running this analysis, we were actually thinking, well, yeah, but the topology of the resulting network is gonna be arbitrary in the sense that we're choosing arbitrarily an alpha value, p value, and we're also, this is an arbitrary null model, right? Uh, which I guess goes to, it's like your general question is why, why this null model? And so we actually thought about this. Um, so this is my detour to try to explain how we thought about it. And I'm gonna make, um, uh, um, so this is gonna get a bit technical, but not too much, hopefully, but so essentially, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a good reason why we choose this filtering approach versus others that have been used in the past. And again, you can find the extended version of what I'm about to say in this paper, which is still under review. But so what we did was to explore the literature and we found three main strategies to filter weighted networks, at least in applied research. Um, um, the first is what we call global thresholding, which essentially means that you normalize the edge weights so that they all fall, again, interval zero, one, but then you start removing the edges that have um, a value lower than x, right? And then, you know, you pr progressively remove the weakest nodes, but there's no statistical reason to use one threshold over another. It's essentially an arbitrary choice. And obviously, the most stringent the threshold is, the sparse of the network becomes until it's empty. And then there's um, another approach, which we call dyadic thresholding, which measures the difference between observed weight strength and the randomly expected strength that a given pair of nodes using a phi correlation coefficient and conventional p-values to determine statistical significance. So this is a dyadic null model. And then there's the, what we call egocentric thresholding, which essentially is a backbone extraction that I just mentioned. We co compare observed and expected strength given the weight distribution around a focal node, right? Now an example of research, I'm gonna give you one example of research that has usage of these techniques in the past. An example of what we call global thresholding is this paper in which the authors examine how the choice of a global threshold impacts the topology of a network and the implications of that choice. The two data sets that they analyze here track email communication. And so in this case, it's a university and a private corporation. I think it's Enron. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. And so essentially the main message that comes out of this paper is that 
um, the conclusions you can draw from your analysis of a network can change drastically depending on the threshold you apply. So no surprise, right? So essentially, this is an approach that allows you to identify a structure that would be hidden if you were, if you were considering all the ties. And so, you know, in the case of the university email data set, it's clearly two clusters. Uh, I mean, you know, some clustering that it becomes more apparent as you start removing the weakest ties, but there's no principal reason why you might choose one threshold over another. Then in this other paper, the authors apply what we call dyadic thresholding, and so in this case, the networks map how many Wikipedia editors work on articles that appear in the editions of different languages and how many Twitter users tweet any pair of languages. And so one of the things that they do before they analyze their data is to calculate this T statistic for every co-occurrence um, uh, to determine if this co-occurrence is higher than expected by random chance, given the different prevalences of languages in the data. But so essentially, they assess statistical significance at the dyadic level. And then there is this paper where the background extraction technique was first introduced uh, and wh where the authors use as an example the transportation system network. And again, here the NALT model is at the egocentric level. And so our question was, so which one do we use, right? Like, so again, thinking about obtaining the most significant structure that we could then analyze, but also in terms of if a reviewer asks, how do we say which approach we use, right? And so here we compare these three different thresholding approaches. For the sake of space here, I'm only showing you what happens with the UK and the US networks. And so the plot summarizes changes in network topology as the filtering threshold becomes more stringent. So the bottom axis track the threshold defined globally. Um, yeah, and the top axis track the threshold as defined by the p-values in the dyadic and the egocentric approaches. And the vertical gray bars highlight the parametric area that is conventionally defined as containing statistically significant results, at least in the social sciences. <coughs> and so what this figure shows is that global thresholding is the most aggressive, unsurprisingly, at eliminating edges and reducing the size of the network. And that is because the distribution of edge weights, at least in our data, is heavily skewed. And so the vast majority of ties are eliminated at relatively low values of the threshold parameter. The egocentric thresholding approach is more stringent at determining the significance of ties than the dyadic approach. Uh, and so for the same significance level, it retains only about a third of the ties that remain significant according to the dyadic null model. But both approaches maintain the same network size for most of the parametric space. Again, we see that centralization scores are twice as high when the egocentric threshold is applied, and this is partly because it breaks uh, the method operates by eliminating clustering or the ties that uh, close triangles. And so these also explain the lower levels of transitivity observed in the networks that are filtered according to this approach. And so our decision was all right. So egocentric, first of all, it makes more sense given the data that we're analyzing and given the huge heterogeneity in new sources in terms of the total reach. Some are really dominating in terms of the number of people that access those sites. And so... Um, you know, defining an art model that operates at that egocentric level made more sense. But it's also um, at this intermediate stage between not eliminating enough ties and eliminating all of the ties, right? So it solves this trait of being eliminating insignificant overlap but also retaining uh, um, uh, many of the connections. Since we published this paper, uh, Michele Kosha and Luca Rossi, they have published a very similar paper where they considered uh, similar question, meaning how defining <coughs> your now model determines the topology of the network that results. And so I really encourage you to read this paper. But the bottom line is that there's no right or wrong answer. You have to choose, you have to make a choice. Uh, and your choice can be more or less conservative, but in general it's good to have some sort of, if you're gonna do this sort of analysis, to have some sort of sensitivity test to make sure that whichever conclusion you draw from your analysis is not totally dependent on your choice of NAR model and uh, significance level. So, end of detour. Is that a hand? No? All right. And back to the paper. Um, so, again, all the analyses that I'm going to show you now are based on the backbone networks that were extracted for a conventional p value of 0 0.5, and most of these analyses are so far descriptive in the sense that we're still chattering the territory and we're still trying to find out the right way of identifying differences across uh, these networks. Uh, all right, so the first thing we did was to look at the centrality scores of new sites classified into groups, legacy and digital born outlets. 
And what we see here is that digital born outlets are more central in the US than legacy media, although the difference is not significant. The UK and the Spanish cases reveal the opposite tendency. Legacy media sites are still more central, which means that they have more overlapping ties with a higher number of other outlets. And in both cases, this difference is significant. Now, we can interpret these centrality scores as proxies to the diversity in audience based. And so in the UK and the Spanish cases, the difference in centrality suggests that legacy media sites are still more attractive to a wider range of the online population, whereas in the US case, it is digital born outlets that are most attractive. If we look at the centralization of these networks, and for those of you who are not familiar with this measure, you should think of this as the network equivalent of the Gini coefficient. What we see is that the US network is the least centralized, particularly so for uh, the younger users who consume news in a more distributed way, but the difference is not huge. Uh, uh, but what this would mean is that they have a more diverse uh, news diet than those in the UK. And I want to make a, a sort of bracket. Um, remember that this is web consumption, right? This is not social media. Uh, this is not people getting exposed to news incidentally as they are browsing their Facebook feed or their Twitter feed. These are people who purposely go to the web to consume news, right? And I think this is a very important caveat to make here because that's driving a lot of the results. This is a self-selected sample of people who, decide, who are interested enough in politics to actually proactively look for news on the web. One of the reasons why we want to compare the structure of these networks uh, when built using Twitter or most importantly Facebook data is because our prior is that then we'll start seeing differences and more clustering and more fragmentation than we see here uh, because of incidental exposure to news. But going back to the schematic representation, what the findings suggest is that the US network would be closer to structure number four and the, U, uh, the US network would be closer to structure number four, and the UK network would be closer to structure number three, with the Spanish case standing somewhere in between. And of course, this is not surprising, given the prominence of the BBC, right, which is like the big hub in the British media landscape. All right, this figure plots the modularity scores of the networks assembled by age groups. And these, again, for those of you not familiar, these scores offer a network statistic that identifies the existence of cluster in a network. Just to illustrate it again with this schematic example, modularity allows us to identify groups of news sites that are similar in their audiences. So uh, in this example, we color coded uh, the clusters. And so we use modularity as a proxy to fragmentation, such that the higher the score, uh, the higher we conclude the observed fragmentation to be. And our expectation was it's going to be some fragmentation, and then we can explain that on the, on the basis of ideological slant of the news outlets. And so people self-select in those news outlets that are closer to their own ideas. Turns out the networks in the three countries show very little evidence of fragmentation. In most cases, the observed modularity score is substantially below the expected random values. And the fact that it's so close to zero suggests that there is no evidence of people self-selecting into specific news sources. And I used to be very apologetic when I presented these findings because public discourse is such today that we are primed to look for fragmentation and polarization everywhere. But the truth of the matter is that these networks show no evidence of polarization or self-selection. And we keep on seeing that over and over in all the other countries that we are analyzing. And again, my sense is that this is because the, the, the data that we're analyzing only reflects the behavior of people who are political junkies or interested enough to be proactive in their search for political news. But there's no evidence of polarization. There's evidence of cold periphery structures, so there's a bunch of news sites that everyone consumes, and then polarization might be, or fragmentation might be happening in the periphery. And this is something that one of my students is working on now. What happens if we start removing the most central uh, websites? Do we start seeing fragmentation in the network? And here, so, so self-selection would happen in niche web, uh, news websites, right? In the smaller news outlets. That's where you really show your true colors, right? You might go to CNN, Fox, whatever, and then go to Breitbart. <laughs> and so we've removed the big news outlets at the center. That's how we can start seeing self-selection. But not when we analyze the entire media landscape. And so overall, we think that this methodological approach can help us be more nuanced <laughs> in our understanding of exposure to news in the digital age. One of the things we plan to do in the future, uh, as I said, we, we're trying to get data also from Twitter and Facebook to analyze and compare the patterns as they emerge in those platforms. Um, but this approach can be applied to any sort of data that has this basic bipartite structure where you have news sources and then you know who's accessing which news, uh, which news source. Um, yes? 
code, mm -hmm. you needed to get the kind of separation. Yeah. And so the key question is, is this kind of confusion an artifact of the fact that you can only the aggregate data? Might be, and that's a good hype, yeah. And so we are trying now to access the competitors' data, uh -huh. and for that we will have not only individual level data um, for individual users, mm -hmm. Uh, but also data on a page level, right? Yeah. So this is uh, domain level. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you go to the New York Times and you go straight to the sports section. I don't know, if they, have, yeah. they don't have a sports section there. Do they? I don't know, I haven't read it. But um, so, yeah, but we don't know. We don't know what's an artifact and what's not an artifact. What, what is for sure is that, so what you're suggesting is that if we were to have more granular information on what actual content people access, we would see uh, frag more, more polarization. In what sense? So because then we would need to also like I mean people always ask me, did you analyze content? No, I mean if we could, I mean but then so if you could. Does a Republican read an article about Elizabeth Warren in the New York Times, or do they read an article about Mitch McConnell talking about? Uh, right, but you could still so claim. Does the Fox News? Does the Fox News audience look at Republican articles? Yeah. Republican themed articles. Mm. That's a hypothesis. I mean, yes. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of conventional wisdom out there that doesn't get any sort of empirical support, and that's very important to know also, right? We have, we are primed to expect those things to happen. Then you analyze the data and you don't see it happening. There was also a lot of, I mean, one of my colleagues, you know, Pablo Barbera has also done research on polarization into, and there's not a strong evidence of polarization, right? And so we can always claim that we are not measuring things in the right way. And that's always healthy in research. Like, let's try to measure things, be more granular, go to you know, individual level data or page level data, and we're planning on doing that. Uh, but let's treat that as a hypothesis. I mean, we are so primed to look for evidence of polarization um, that when we don't get it, it's, oh, we're doing something wrong. Well, maybe there's no polarization, you know? But, I, but that's something we're planning on doing because I think that's a good point. But uh, it, it's not obvious either. I mean, the example that you just gave it's custom, it's custom made to sort of illustrate how polarization and self-selection might there happen. But then there is obvious polarization, right? There is people who vote for Trump because they say Hillary is, is a bad person. There is, there is polarization. You can see it in the Congress. You can see it in the voting behavior. If you say there is no polarization, All right, so maybe we should. There is no polarization. There is in news consumption. In news consumption. There is consumption. Yeah. There is not. In news consumption, yeah. Uh, and that's another part of the problem that we talk about things in very generic terms. Uh, and so this project relates only to the question of how, what kind of information be people get exposed to. And the prior was, you know, if you're right-leaning, you're going to consume right-leaning outlets that we know have a slant. If you're left-leaning, you're going to consume. And so if that were the case, the networks would look different, right? And so I'm only making claims in the very narrow context of exposure to news, but that's so we, you know, like that's uh, part of the theorizing as to why people are polarized, right? <laughs> it's not the only one, but yes. But you have to repeat the question right? uh, <laughs> and speak louder. <laughs> uh, have you like, looked at the evolutionary properties? Yeah. No, not yet. We are, we are trying to do that. Um, so the big driver of changes is that um, it's, so, so these networks are very influenced by the total reach of the new sources. And some keep on growing, right? And some uh, are going down. Uh, and so that's going to affect the structure of the network and the connectivity, but we haven't done it yet. We have assessed changes over time for the uh, ha aggregated high-level measure of how many people access these sources. But, um, but yeah, good I mean, that's, that's something, you know, like that needs to be explored. So if you have ideas, <laughs> something else? All right. So, <clears throat> all right, uh, third part of the talk. So this is really super messy, right? In the sense that we don't even have a paper written yet. Um, um, and so this is a project in which we're still kind of trying to figure out what we're doing. 
Uh, but it's, it's a continuation of what I just showed you in the sense that here we're trying to measure the visibility of news sources across media channels during contentious political events, so that's political protests. Uh, this is a collaboration with Manuel Domenico, who leads the complex multi-layer networks lab at the Bruno Kessler Foundation in Trento. And again, to contextualize it in the bigger picture, this is a project that belongs to the mesoscale level of analysis. So it's about um, networks of information diffusion and mobilization. And as I said, it's still pretty much work in progress. But let me tell you a little bit about the motivation. So what we do in this project is um, track communication um, um, activity in social media, so that's Twitter, during the Yellow Vest uh, protests that arose in France in November, December of last year. Are there any French people here? No French people? All right, well, so for those of you who are not very familiar, this mobilization has been defined by some as a grassroots uh, revolutionary political movement for economic justice. Uh, of course, how you qualify this movement depends on who you ask, but that's my definition. There were a few episodes of violent confrontation with the police, and the one question that we wanted to answer is if the data uh, shows evidence of information manipulation or inflammatory tactics. Uh, and we sort of realized that before we could attack that question, we had to assess the relative prevalence of uh, legitimate news sources via V. Uh, less legitimate news sources, and we had to do that in a way that is scalable. And so we are trying to build on a prior paper that finds evidence of both increasing exposure to negative and inflammatory content during contentious uh, political events. In the case of this paper, they analyzed the Catalan referendum for independence that was celebrated in October of 2017. And so the analysis uh, reported in this paper show that there were two polarized uh, groups, there were the independentists and the constitutionalists, and that both were acting from peripheral areas to target influential users in both groups and exacerbate social conflict, right? And so in our project, we are using the same strategy to identify accounts that are likely to be bought. And I say likely because it's never like, entirely certain whether an account is a bot or not, but anyway, so there's reliability issues and what. But so we also do something else, which is to differentiate verified from unverified accounts, right? And so if your account is classified as bot, but it's also verified by Twitter, we label that account as media, because many of those accounts that have uh, bot-like behavior but are verified are managed by journalists and media organizations. Um, so this is our first choice, we make that choice. And uh, this is a high level description of the data that we're analyzing. In total, we analyzed more than seven million unique tweets created by close to a million users spanning the two month period of November to December of 2018. Less than 1% of all the accounts in our data fall in this media category, right? So, um, um, which is interesting in itself. Accounts classified as unverified bots amounted to 38% of all users, which is also interesting, and the rest were classified as human. And the table in panel B summarizes descriptive statistics of the retweet network extracted from uh, these messages. Uh, and so most of the centrality measures that are purely descriptive, but uh, that I'll discuss later, refer to this network. All right, so in addition to the Twitter data, we also have the web browsing behavior that I discussed in the previous project. And so what this figure summarizes is the percentage reach of news sources that were accessed on the web in France during the same time period. So this is not Twitter, this is web data, right? So this is based on what people who access the web during this time period did. The list of news sources identified in this web tracking data include uh, legacy, legacy media brands like Le Figaro or Le Monde, but also digital born outlets like the French edition of the Huffington Post. And as usual, these websites vary very greatly in the size of the audiences they reach. Uh, as you can see in panel B, only 5% of the websites have a reach above 14% of the online population, which is really low. So only 14% of the online population access the most prominent sites. These are the prominent sites, right? And so, I mean, you know, I have colleagues in political communication, it's very well known that entertainment always wins. <laughs> you know, like, uh, there's this idea of the, um, you know, an epistemological understanding of democracy that requires an informed citizen, but most citizens don't care. <laughs> they seem to go to entertainment rather than to news, and of course you can fit news into entertainment, but anyway. So this is what the web tracking data tell us, and our goal is to use this information as a benchmark of news visibility to compare with social media activity. 
So we essentially want to know whether the websites that were the news sources that were most prominent on the web were also the most prominent in this stream of information related to the protest. First, some descriptive um, findings. The scatter plots um, here show the relative centrality of the three types of user accounts according to the number of followers, that's panel A, the number of accounts followed, that's panel B, in degree centrality, that's panel C, and uh, out degree centrality in the retweet network. And so in spite of what I find most significant of this is that in spite of their small number, the accounts that are classified as media are the most central, both in terms of their overall position in the Twitter network, especially uh, in the number of followers, but also in the specific stream of information related to the Yellow Vest protest, and especially in terms of in degree in the retweet network. So these sources, the accounts uh, that are classified as media get retweeted most frequently during these events, which you know, one would argue is a good thing when we don't get into content. <laughs> they, don't, they don't always do good things. Uh, media accounts do not cluster in any specific community in the network. Panel B shows the composition of the top 10 communities identified with a random walk algorithm. The modularity score is 0.63. And this panel suggests that there is no clear concentration of user types in specific communities. But media accounts do receive more retweets than bots or humans. Panel A shows um, the network contracted to the three types of nodes. And the box plots at the bottom compare the observed centrality scores, those are the red dots, uh, with the distribution of values that you would expect uh, uh, from networks that have permuted labels. Uh, and so essentially what this is telling us is that media accounts receive substantially more retweets than expected by chance. And if we look at temporal dynamics in terms of volume over time, most of the messages are generated by human accounts, but media accounts receive, um, on average, a substantially higher number of retweets across the full observation window. Uh, but essentially what this is telling us is that the lifespan of the messages that are published or posted by media accounts is not different from the lifespan of messages posted by bots or humans. So this is all messy in the sense that this is us trying to get sense of the data. And so seeing if we find anything kind of interesting or meaningful, but this is what has caught my interest the most, right? Like this is the most interesting thing we have found so far. Again, in order to compare the visibility of these media accounts uh, on social media with their larger visibility on the web, what we did was to match the Twitter data with the web browsing data and of the approximately 190 uh, news websites that are part of the web browsing behavior data set, we could only match 76 with media tw uh, Twitter handles. And what this figure shows is the rank position of these news organizations on the web according to their audience reach, and that's the vertical axis, and on Twitter according to their number of followers in panel A and their centrality in the retweet network in panel B. And as the scatter plots show, there is again very low agreement in the visibility rank of these news sources, which means that exposure to news is qualitatively different on social media as these events were happening. So people were getting their information from different places as these events were happening. Now, we don't necessarily know what this means. <laughs> what, we, what it means is that the media environment can be very different depending on whether you're navigating the web or you're navigating your Twitter uh, feed. And of course, these are always self-selected uh, you know, groups of people who decide to get their news from different places. But the information environment that people who were interested in uh, this protest was very different uh, uh, in social media compared to what um, the web tracking data tell us. Now, these are just some of the next steps we want to take. We want to replicate these with other cases of contentious politics, including the Catalan referendum, and see if we find similar patterns. And we want to find multi-layer measures of centrality for news sources across media channels, because essentially we now have two layers. The nodes are the same, the news sources, but let the structure of those networks look very different. And so we want to be able to come up with a way of comparing those multi-layer structures, and that's Manlio's area of expertise. So, so end to the messy part. And again, if you have ideas or suggestions, super welcome. Um, but I just want to end now. And I want to quickly go back to the beginning and to the book. <laughs> but so to, to my mind, the most important thing that digital technologies and the web are doing is to challenge um, the old measurement instruments that we have used in the past. And, and they're offering new ways of measuring and mapping the social world. And the only way, I'm an empiricist, the only way in which we can theorize in a meaningful way about the world, and by meaningful I mean in a way that is conducive to potential interventions to change the things that we don't like, uh, 
uh, is by devising better ways of measuring the world. And so we can do things now that we couldn't do in the past, um, and that's great. And this is not to say that we can also fall in the trap of convenient choices when it comes to analyzing digital data. And so this is the big problem that I think all digital researchers will have to confront, that at some point we find ourselves analyzing the data that we're analyzing because that's the only thing that's available. I think we have to be also, and I include myself in the group, you know, we have to be more ambitious and sort of try to come up with ways of measuring what we cannot measure yet, even if it's not the most convenient thing to do. Um, but I, what I think makes much of the digital research that take place today so exciting is that it tries to improve the accuracy of our measures and this potentially can improve our understanding of the world and of course this is a collective enterprise. Nicola mentioned this book uh, at the beginning. Um, this is an edited volume that is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Most of the chapters are already online but the printed version is coming soon and in this handbook we have more than 50 authors, some of them present uh, in this room based in 30 different uh, cities in 11 different countries across the globe, considering also this question of how digital traces help us unpack um, some of the key problems that social scientists have considered for decades, right? And what makes this handbook so unique and what makes this handbook, Brooke and I are very proud of this handbook mostly because we managed to bring together researchers from a bunch of disciplines that don't usually work together. They all said yes, so we're very happy. But the, the, the contributing authors include scholars in information science, sociology, computer science, physics, communication, political science. And so in that sense, I think it captures the spirit of this summer school and computational social science more generally. Uh, the handbook is divided in six sections that we editors thought summarized key areas of interest in this emerging field of cross-disciplinary work. But of course, there's probably way more areas that we could have highlighted. These are the ones that we thought were prominent at the time we brought um, the, the book together. Um, and I just want to end with a shout out to all of you because you're writing your thesis, you're starting your research careers, and it's up to you to help us push the frontiers that we kind of sketch in this handbook even further, right? Like, so you're the ones who are going to have to take this, which is what we <laughs> are doing now, even further. And so, um, yeah, this is a very exciting time with a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities, and hopefully you can all feel uh, the, that optimistic, as optimistic as I feel, because I think we have reasons to be optimistic. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>